say, you know, I knew I should have made a left turn at Albuquerque. Hmm. Don't look much like Los Angeles to me. I knew I should have taken that left turn at Albuquerque. Well, here I am. Hey, just a cotton-picking minute. This don't look like the Coachella Valley to me. Hmm. I knew I should have taken that left turn at Albuquerque. Uh, let's see now, uh... Hmm, South Pole? Oh, I get it. I should have turned left at Albuquerque. Well, here we are, Pismo Beach and all the clams we can eat. What a way for a duck to travel. Underground. Hey, wait a minute. Since when is Pismo Beach inside a cave? I wonder... Uh, you know, I just bet we should have turned left at Albuquerque. And then maybe a right turn at La Jolla. Hmm. Uh... Yeah. <laughs> well, welcome back, guys, to uh, week two. And we're going to be taking a look at... Guess what we're going to be taking a look at? Guess what subject's going to be, right? Uh, math. And we'll take a look at uh, various map projections and get the ball rolling here. Go ahead, make your heads up terms. We're going to be taking a look at uh, this time around cartography. Cartography is your you know map making science, and we're going to take a look at um, four major types of map projection. Uh, the equivalent projection, which uh, its strength is area, focusing on area. Uh, you have your conformal projection. Uh, its strength is getting the exact uh, dimensions of, sh of shapes. Uh, equidistant project projection is exactly how it sounds, right? Distance. And then you have your azimuthal, azimuthal slash Robinson projection. And that's basically a um, kind of a compromise of the, the three aforementioned projections. Topographic maps are general purpose maps, um, popular, you know, in your parents, grandparents' day and beyond. You can get them at AAA gas stations and, you know, whole night your glove compartment and, right. Very popular maps, probably not as prevalent today with GPS. I don't, I don't, even I don't uh, use them anymore. Uh, aerial photos. Uh, aerial photos are you know, basically the technique of uh, photographing a land area from an airplane. Um, satellite imagery. Satellite imagery is, um, you know, basically taking you know, shots from, from space, right? And that's uh, controversial. We'll talk about, uh, we'll address that, okay? Remote and remote sensing. Remote sensing is uh, where you're um, taking aerial shots again at coastlines and mountain areas and, you know, water detail. And then you have your GIS your geographic information system and that there is computer based and it assembles stores alters analyzes geographical data as well uh, to take down geograph millions of, uh, of, of data and millions of data in just a matter of uh, matter of seconds so what we want to do here in uh, this chapter we want to become aware of the various map projections recognize the purposes maps can be used for and appreciate the benefits of remote sensing. So what I'm gonna do is um, you have your white space and um, the, air, the terminal, the, the, um, the things you have to write down, I have here in the italicized print. And as this is a PowerPoint, you can copy those down. Um, I'm gonna mention it, I'm gonna, I'm gonna read it. Uh, you can do that before I read it or after you have your, your pause button. So with no further delay, let's get into this. And um, a basic means of um, describing the earth in which we live 
uh, map uh, can communicate effectively if we appreciate the logic uh, behind their construction and modes of presentation. So cartography is map science and technology. Uh, map makers are there for your cartographers. Now an artificial grid system is essential to locate points on a sphere. The grid system of meridians and parallels or latitude and longitude is the most common, but you have other systems that are important too. And uh, if you want to turn to um, page 22, and um, got some nice visuals on this, and this is probably harkening back to uh, information you got back in high school or middle school. Uh, latitude, this is the distance north or south of the equator. Measured in degrees zero to 90 from the equator to the, uh, to the north and south poles. Prime meridian, this is a second coordinate to specify the distance east to west. And the starting point cartographers use is an imaginary line passing through an observatory in Greenwich, England. I think figure 20 or 21B uh, highlights this, 21A uh, highlights um, uh, the latitude and uh, prime meridian. Yeah, this was selected at zero degree longitude by an international conference in the 1880s that was uh, meeting in Greenwich, England. Longitude is the distance east to west, ranging from zero to 180 degrees, uh, figure 2.1b. And then directly opposite the prime meridian is the 180th meridian, the international date line, figure 2.2 over on page 23. And therefore, time uh, depends on longitude. So as the Earth rotates every 24 hours, it's divided into 24 time zones. Um, just an FYI about these. Let me just, uh, you don't have to write this down, but as I said, for your information, uh, the Earth's diameter uh, at the equator is 7,000 927 miles wide, while from pole to pole, it is 79,000 miles. So on a 30.5 centimeter, 12 inch globe, uh, this, dif this difference is about 27 miles, right? 27 miles thick as a, a wire in a paper clip. And you know, on the Earth's circumference, it's just a 27 mile, 27 mile difference. So that 27 mile difference, when you take a look at it on a, you know, a classroom globe or so forth, is just that about as thick as a wire in a paper clip. Uh, the variation from a spherical shape is less than one third of one percent, uh, and is not noticeable in view of Earth from Earth's face. Probably no surprise there. Uh, the Earth's highest point, landforms also cause uh, departures from true sphericity. Uh, Mount Everest in the Himalayas, in fact, is the Earth's highest point, and that's uh, uh, 29,035 feet above sea level. The lowest point, the lowest point is the um, Challenger Deep in the Mariana Trench of the Pacific Southwest. Um, probably southwest of Guam, and uh, that's 36,200 feet below sea level. So the difference between those two elevations is um, just 12 miles, 12 miles. And that would also be insignificant on a um, standard globe. Longitude and time. There's something else here I wanted to talk about. Oh, the international date line. <laughs> international date line. Um, the need for such a line on Earth to adjust the day was inadvertently discovered by Magellan's crew. You guys remember him from uh, elementary school days, right? One of the great voyagers. 
who uh, from 1519, 1521, were the first to circumnavigate the world, uh, sailing westward from Spain when they returned from their voyage, it was noticed that one day had apparently been missed in the ship's log. When it, what actually happened was that in going around the world in a westward direction, uh, the crew had experienced one less sun, sunset and one less sunrise than it occurred in Spain uh, during their absence. So some interesting little tidbits there. FYI's, as I like to call them. Let's get into map projections now. And let me just set this up by saying that because the Earth is um, not flat, some system of projection is, uh, is, is necessary to transform the, these spherical coordinates onto a flat surface. But because projection, because projection involves distortion, the cartographer, the map maker, must evaluate the intended use of the map to determine which projection to use. So area, shape, distance, and direction are distorted in different ways and the different degree, different degrees by each projection. Let's take a look at this here. And you can turn to um, page 25 and look at figure 2.5 um, illustrations A and B. We'll look at the equivalent projection. And uh, the equivalent projection, its focus is area, right? Area. And it's used to show aerial extents uh, to, that tend to distort regions. So you're going to lose out on regions. Uh, via this projection. And it's used to present regions accurately to what they are on Earth. Square miles on a map, right, equals square inches on a map. For example, squ a square uh, on, the, uh, on the Earth may, in fact, be a rectangle on the map, while the rectangle on the map may be still the correct area. And the equivalent projections used to show aerial extent of some phenomena, uh, population patterns, um, agricultural patterns, some kind of forested area. Conformal projections, uh, again, figure 2.5C, conformal projection, uh, I think it's at the bottom of page, page 26. And it's called a Mercator projection as well, a Mercator projection. And what the Mercator projection, a conformal projection does, it makes regions and features look right uh, and, and have some kind of correct directional relationship. It makes parallels and meridians cross each other at right angles. And the scale is the same at all locations. It's good for small areas. Uh, large areas like continents uh, tend to get distorted with this type of projection. Then you have your equidistant projections. Your equidist equidistant projections. And as I said earlier, its focus was on what, how it sounds, right? Distance. It shows the exact distance from all directions, but only but only from two points, figure 2.6a, um, give you some pictorial illustrations of this type of projection. But here's the thing with this uh, type of projection, it focuses on distance from two points. So distance from other areas will be distorted. For instance, if the map is centered on Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, it's going to show the, dis the correct distance between Saskatoon and Vancouver, Saskatoon and Calgary, Saskatoon and Montreal, Saskatoon and any city on the globe, right? Uh, however, it's not going to show the correct distance between Vancouver and Calgary in that instance. 
And then lastly, you have your Azimuthal slash Robinson projection. And that's 2.6A, I believe, on page 27. And um, that focuses on true direction from one central point. It's a compromise between the aforementioned projections, right? So what, what this is going to do is it's going to allow distortion in one area to improve uh, another. So it's gonna, it, might, it might distort elevations in order to improve the size of continents. Here's the big picture, and this sounds like it might be a good quiz question. The big picture, because of the shape of the Earth, you're going to get distortions, right? One is going to get distortions. Turn now to figure 2-1 over on page 31. And um, you have some notes there for some white space. Your topographic maps, these are general purpose maps and they focus on elevation and the uh, shape of terrain. And they're accurate on surface features in small areas. This is why people used to get them, right? Like uh, they would show you orchards or the, where the arch was in St. Louis. And I would say this too, you don't have to write this down obviously, but topographic maps, they pro just provide a wealth of information about both the natural and cultural landscape features. All of the main concern with those are uh, elevation as uh, resented, uh, represented by contours. And you can see that type of map over on figure 210 page 31, and they're published at several different map scales. And, you know, topographic maps have a lot of different uses as a result. Like I said, they're general purpose maps. Uh, aerial photography and the use of global positioning systems, GPS, supplement the traditional surveying and gathering data for uh, topographic maps. Now, before we get to map distortions, I want to just talk about some different types of maps, and you can see those if you want to turn over to page 33, and um, I think 33 would do it. Let me just uh, take a peek at that here. Apologize for that. Couldn't read my writing, is what happened there. Yeah, page 33. 34 and 35, I'm going to, um, I didn't camp out in 35, because I'm going to spend some time there on map distortions, but maps are basic to the um, study of spatial patterns, and different techniques are used to record the number of objects at specific points in given areas, or even along certain lines. So on some of these maps, you can see this, you have dots, proportional circles, and three-dimensional symbols are common ways of indicating quantities at, at different points. Uh, figure 211, the um, Coraplief map, uh, for instance, does that. And then for variations over areas, too, your Coraplief maps show how the amount of a phenomenon varies from one area to from area to area uh, using contrasting colors or, or patterns. Then you have examples of map lines that denote numerical values. And these are basically isolines or, or flow lines. Figure 213 uh, gives you a map of um, you know, such detail. Now map distortions. Looking back at our fills here, map distortions on page um, 35, figure 215. It's imperative. It's imperative to remember that uh, all maps are distractions of reality, and they therefore can be distorted. So some of the reasons behind distortion are three big ones. The first one is ignorance. Um, you know, ignorance of the unknown. And in the early days of 
in other words, in the early days of cartography, um, you had this, right? You had ignorance of the unknown. So we can forgive that, right? Then you have propaganda, and it wasn't so sad and evil with the Nazis. It's almost humorous to take a look at um, the illustration there on the left-hand side, figure 215, uh, a propaganda map of the Nazis of, you know, being surrounded by enemies, right, to make you feel sorry for them. And then you have uh, the map on the right there, military and intelligence operations, another reason for uh, map dis uh, 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 distortions. And uh, I remember um, hearing about this back during the days of the Cold War. Um, Soviets knew we were, I mean, we you couldn't readily fly any planes over the Soviet Union. They'd get shot down right during the Cold War. So we relied on maps and Soviets knew that. So they would switch maps around of different towns on us. Uh, one year, the, some small town might have the railroad going in the north of town and a river in the south. And the next year they'd flip that around or maybe would eliminate you know, a railroad or whatever. So for military and intelligence operations, Before we get into remote sensing, I wanted to talk about um, aerial photography, some FYIs here. Uh, aerial photography is one method of remote sensing. Uh, two other methods are non-photographic imagery, such as that provided by thermal scanners and, and uh, radar. And then you have satellite, satellite imagery, which I'm gonna elaborate on here oh, uh, shortly. Among the advantages of remote sensing are its speed and, um, in fact, I think I'll leave that overview uh, until after my FYIs here. Aerial photography, uh, basically, um, it's considered outside the realm of privacy. So therefore, anything witnessed from the view of an aircraft is considered public domain. The exception is that uh, when aircraft uses thermal probes, as found unconstitutional by the Supreme Court of the United States, and thermal probes see through walls. So you have to be careful of who's using that, uh, right? We don't want people looking to, in, into our homes, the military, for instance. Uh, they can do that, and they were doing that over in Iraq during the, the war on terror, and that was, a, uh, that was under a different legal legal purview. But just finishing this setup here, um, among the advantages of remote sensing, which we're gonna detail, are speed and accuracy. So the ability to map areas otherwise hard to uh, survey. And then you get the option of gathering data during nighttime as well as the day. So in addition, uh, remote sensing technologies can record both visible and invisible wavelengths of the uh, electromagnetic spectrum. Thus, with that, you can identify characteristics that might not be obvious to the uh, naked eye. So remote sensing, it gives us the exact slope and size of features such as mountains, rivers, and coastlines millions of square miles can be surveyed in a short of time a short span of time a type of aerial photography is an orthophoto map uh, it specializes in forest management soil erosion uh, studies population and city planning remote sensing is also used to clarify vegetation features of the earth such as water details now, I know you guys are gonna be copying this down in your white space area for notes there, but um, don't miss this. See civilian spy satellites, the satellites on page 40. Read that because I'm looking out ahead to the end of the week and your discussion question is going to revolve around this. So if you don't read this, uh, you're gonna be, I'm gonna be looking at your discussion question and saying, it just does not make sense, and it's not going to be good for the grade, right? I'm a lover, not a fighter. I don't mean to sound harsh, but you get the picture. You're going to need to read that. 
And lastly, your GIS systems. Um, in recent years, just kind of setting this up too, There we go. So you guys will listen to me. In recent years, computers have become an integral part of uh, every stage of the cartographic process. Your geographic information system, or your GIS, is a tool for assembling and storing a, a lot of data. Its major components are the geographic database, or what we call the digital map data. So it's the hardware are basically used to store and receive data and associated computer software. So now I will scroll down and read this. Uh, procedures are computer-based, uh, assembling, storing, altering, analyzing geographic data. It's uh, geographic data to record spatial information such as like wetlands damage. Right through qualitative maps of rainfall, um, soil types, water pollution, et cetera, et cetera. Urban planners use GIS for studying political boundaries, uh, census tracts, uh, population distribution, building inventory, uh, housing employment, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this computerized map making sy system revises existing maps to update them, right? Like population data, population sizes are constantly changing. Big picture here, they can produce millions of facts in uh, literally seconds. So getting at your graphic organizer, we'll recap. Cartography is the map making process. We looked at the artificial grid system, right? Your latitude is your latitude lines or parallel lines, distance going from north to south at zero to 90 degrees. Your prime meridian is your second coordinate measuring east to west. Um, you have your international date line, time depending on longitude, 24 hour rotation. Uh, your imaginary line, zero degree longitude with your meridians. Uh, going zero degree to 180 degrees east to west. All right, and your international agreement set the standardized time zones. Map projections, we looked at the equivalent area, uh, equivalent maps focusing, featuring on area, uh, the aerial extent of something, you know, for example, population, its strengths, the aerial extent, um, square miles on a map equals square inches. Uh, the problem is that uh, this tends to distort regions. Your conformal maps, focusing on shape, regions and small areas. It's really good on that. Uh, continents and large shapes tend to get distorted. Then you got your equidistant maps, right? Focusing on distance, uh, exact distance from the perspective of two places, but um, you know any other areas. Uh, tend to get distorted outside of those two places. Ro the Robinson azimuthal map direction, and it's a compromise of the former three, but in order to do that, it distorts a little bit of the uh, aforementioned three. And you got your general purpose maps, your topographic maps, accurate on surface, um, you know, surface areas, small areas. Map distortions out of ignorance, out of you know, via propaganda and military purposes. Remote sensing, exactness on slope and size, millions of square miles can be surveyed and it's used to clarify things like water and vegetation detail. And then you got your geographic uh, information systems, computer based, record spatial information. And it's great for urban planning, and then you can see the breakdown of that. So, let's take a look at where we're going here this week. And, uh, wrong button. Let's go here. Tuesday. Um, 
I would recommend reading Civilian Spy Thread right from page 40, vital to the discussion post. Reason why I, I'm recommending it there, uh, because you've got Wednesday, for me, as well as other classes, um, gonna have a guided practice assignment. And I was thinking when I wrote that out, I wasn't quite sure uh, what that was, but I, um, I was sure before I started this lecture. I have it drawn out and I forgot what it was, but you're going to get it. It's going to be uh, uh, some analysis of the uh, through the, via the lecture model, of course. Uh, Thursday, you got your lab. Your lab, you're going to be, you know, analyzing maps and map, the map making process. You know, pretty cool lab. These are all really good labs. By the time you're done with uh, this course, you're going to wonder, why any other social scientists would want to be studying anything else? But Friday, you have your initial post due by midnight, and then by Sunday, your two response posts, right? So by the next chapter or two, you'll get the, the drill, the rhythm on, the, on how this works. Monday, we will quiz on chapter two, and then we'll begin uh, the lecture model and lecture for chapter three, Physical Geography, Land Florence. So there you have it. And uh, if you guys have questions, comments, don't hesitate to um, get a hold of me, right? So otherwise, you guys have a great day and a fantastic week. And uh, talk to you next time. Bye.